we're following the sad declension by which the earthly paradise in fourth chapter in the fourth book of Nephi declined into the living type of living hell which we find in many parts of the world today. This is one of the most valuable texts we have in the world. There's nothing like it. It shows us step by step exactly how it happens. So let us prepend, let us pay attention. I hope to finish it the last time we'll get on to to the even more tragic Book of Mormon, perhaps today. <clears throat> but you'll notice we're at, we got the 27th verse. And here we see the new churches retained their traditions, of course. They were not seeking to be original. They claimed to be the old true church. This is the cafeteria theory of the church, you know. Uh, my son, some years ago, was a bishop in San Francisco. and. Uh, there was a rich man in the ward who were delighted in the gospel because it says it's just like a cafeteria. You can take what you please and you can leave the rest. Take what you want and so forth. Well, exactly what was happening here, you see. Uh, and they, they were, they were back in 27. There were many churches which professed to know the Christ, you see. And they did deny the more parts. They took some parts. They kept parts of the gospel that they got rid of others they didn't like. Well, we do that the same way. They did deny the more parts of the gospel in so much they did receive all manner of wickedness. Take that in and so forth. And they went further than that. You see, they had the gospel. They denied most of it though. And, but they still had the forms and the ordinances and they administered them as far as that goes. See. They professed to know the Christ. They accommodated their doctrines uh, to the market. They supplied temp temple recommends on demand. It says here they would, they would administer that which was sacred to those who didn't, who shouldn't have it, to the wrong people, and because they knew what was sacred, and they claimed to have it and sell it, and so here we go on. And the 27th verse tells us a lot. Well, every one of these verses is loaded, you'll notice here. Notice. And it was very popular. The church grew phenomenally as a result of this. Remember, this is the church we're talking about. This is not apostates. Give them what you want and you'll win. Uh, this is the Nehor story already. Remember the Nehors were so permissive and they taught the people exactly what they wanted to hear so the Nehors grew like crazy. And uh, we do that today. Of course, you have a, you have a survey. You, you, t you take a poll and decide what people want and then that's what you give them and then you get elected, of course. So the growth of the church, this verse also teaches another thing, doesn't it? This uh, 28th verse that the phenomenal growth of the church is no proof that it's true at all, that, it, that it's following, that it's on the true path, not a bit of it. See. It grew faster than anything because it's very popular. So don't use popularity as a gauge either as far as that goes. Well then, we get to, I've just been running down this stuff this morning. Uh, there was a more active outfit, a more active group. They aggressively attacked the original church. They made fun of their miracles. Well, who would make fun of a miracle? Miracles that are premium, miracles what we want, and so forth, through the 29th verse here. They despise them because of the many miracles they see. Could see the miracles, you see. The, uh, <clears throat> well, miracles do not convert people. That's another point. The miracles that had the very opposite effect here, as far as that goes. Uh, they despised what they couldn't see. Of course, miracles are going on that you may not recognize as miracles, too. Remember, as Buckminster Fuller tells us, it's, it's all a miracle. Uh, in the end, as Morris Klein, the great mathematician, says, it's all mystery, and a mystery is a miracle. After all, if it happens at all and you can't possibly explain it, what is a miracle? It's a miraculum. It means a little thing that makes you wonder. <laughs> Milagroso, you see, it's, it's, it's a miracle. Uh, notice it's a diminutive, miraculum, a little thing that makes you miro, mirara, mirara is to wonder, to admire, with open mouth, you see, in admired amazement. So that's what a miracle was, and they despised anything like that. The, uh, they just brushed them aside, and you can do it with everything as far as that goes. But they had the power and the authority. They had the office. You notice here, here, they did exercise power and authority over the disciples of Jesus. Well, if they belong to another church, how come? They exercised power and authority. Not legal, it's, it's religious here, because it was a sacral state who did tarry with them, and they'd, the ones that were foolish enough to remain, and threw them into prison and so forth. And it didn't do much good, though. So they were uh, aggressive and obnoxious, and they grew up in the heart of the old church, and they gave a bad time to the old disciples of Jesus. They singled them out as an element which would have to be removed. 
along with their miracles. Uh, but the others, having retained their integrity, they also retained their powers, and they couldn't be stopped. They kept right on. So now we get an interesting thing, and this, all this is going on inside the church. So it's a very interesting situation. They're not divided into two others the same way with the, with the persecutions in the, in the Reformation and after, 16th and 17th centuries. You find the same sort of thing going on. Oh, the most best example is with the Jews, as we see. Well then, in the 31st verse, what do we have happen? The people hardened their hearts and sought to kill them. It's a strange phenomenon. But no, even as the Jews at Jerusalem sought to kill Jesus. Here you see it. It's not an, uh, they were not dealing with opposite religions here at all. The situation in, Je in Jerusalem was the same thing. Jesus and the scribes and the Pharisees and the doctors of the multitude all followed the law of Moses. They were all preaching the law of Moses. They were different. <laughs> Palestine at all times was the scene of all sorts of cults. You wouldn't get persecuted for not being a Jew. You wouldn't be persecuted. They had a, the cults that throve. Well, we saw that. see that in the Book of Mormon, too, where they go over uh, the cult of Jezebel, for example, which flourished at that time. But that, that was in Philistia. The Jews would go over to practice that. But they, the Greeks were very influential. The Egyptians were very influential in Egypt at the time of Lehi, and their religions flourished and were not persecuted or anything like that. That isn't the issue at all here, you see. Because the... Uh, but if you don't want to believe, of course, miracles will, own you of, will only offend you here. And remember, it was the miracles of Jesus, culminating with the raising of Lazarus, it was the miracles that turned the leaders of the Jews most against him. It was the raising of Lazarus from the dead that made them finally decide that he would have to be put out of the way. They, they couldn't let this go on any longer, you see. But it's all inside the church. The whole thing is going on there. And then we get verses 32 and 33. They do these various things to them pretty rough treatment. They wouldn't treat outsiders this way. I say there were many cults in Palestine. And it's, you're not blamed if you don't belong to that particular cult. Uh, only a Jew could be punished, you see, by the Jewish law. They couldn't, couldn't lay a finger on anybody else. After all, the Romans were much stronger than the Jews in, in uh, the time of Christ when the Lord was there. The predominant religion was that followed by, by Pilate. Well, the, the Tenth Legion was there, and we have their cults, and they had the cult of Mithra, it was very strong even at that time. Well, later it flourishes. Well, anyway, these people seem determined to ruin their own happiness. Notice the 34th verse. They go on hardening their hearts, led by many priests. It's a religious movement, you know. You know they're led by many priests. And uh, in, the early, in the early 17th century, you get the same sort of thing, the same sort of depravity, the restless, the violent, the cruel times. Everybody was cynical. Everybody was heartless. You could change. They changed religions all the time. It made no difference. You had to have one or the other. And when you changed from the one, you'd start fighting the other and the other way around. They started going back and forth the same way. Look at the, the wars and Wallenstein uh, and the uh, and Gustavus Adolphus, uh, Gustavus Adolphus, and the rest of them. And uh, well, Wallenstein. They would cynically change sides and and go on fighting. This strange, insane cruelty, they say, this doesn't make sense. Who's writing? What kind of a history is this? The people hardened their hearts and led by many priests and set up many churches. They did smite upon the people of Jesus to dwindle in unbelief and in wickedness. Uh, it's the old bad business they're back to, and it's pretty bad. Well, you see it in the world today. You see, just yesterday, the Christians in Lebanon resumed shooting at each other. I mean, really, going at each other hot and heavy with artillery, fires, mortar, everything else, all day long. Two Christian sects in the middle of Beirut, which is always considered the most sophisticated, the most educated city in the East. And you know what it's become now. Well, right before our very eyes, these silly things are happening. The, uh, they ruin their own happiness. They, why do we do it? Well, of course, there's somebody there making it happen. Uh, because these people are normally very, very friendly, after all. Uh, the Jews and the Arabs and the Christians have lived very, very peaceably together in, uh, in Beirut for some hundred years, and then all of a sudden they have to destroy each other, but especially themselves. Well, uh, and then here, this is an important thing too, uh, led in by these many priests. In the second century, the church broke up into lots of sects. Uh, Epiphanius lists 88 different churches. All these splinter groups flowed out. The second century was the century of of uh, disbelief. But every single sect regarded itself as the old original church and all the others as offshoots and, and uh, sprouts and so forth as the splinter groups. 
but everyone claimed it was the original. And this same thing happens here. There are various churches here, each one claiming to be the original church, having the same basic doctrines and so forth. And so this insanity goes on. The, uh, and, uh, well, let's see what they claim here. But I'm, I've just been marking some things down here. They're led by many priests, false prophets, but many churches. You know, they build up many churches, but each one claimed to be the original one. And despite upon the people of Jesus, there was that, that group is always there. You notice it keeps pointing them out again and again. There's that little nucleus called the people of Jesus that remain faithful. <coughs> They're always very much of a monotony. And they dwindled in unbelief and into wickedness. And then finally comes a real showdown. The movement ended in this great division of the people. Like the Thirty Years' War, finally it had to come, the division. You had to be on one side or the other. But people switched easily and often, as I said before. Uh, and each time, they heartily hated the other side. Uh, but the, the true believers finally asserted themselves and, and broke off communion with the others. Notice in the 36th verse what happens then. <coughs> there arose a people who were called the Nephites. Now, there's a strange thing happening. See, this is all one big mix, one mess. It's time to, to sort of sort things out. There were the people who were called the Nephites, and there were the true believers in Christ among them. There were those who were called by the Lamanites, Jacobites, and Josephites, and Zoramites. Uh, these are the three tribes, well, Nephites, but Jacobites, Josephites, and Zoramites. And there were the three, uh, the four Nephite tribes and the three Lamanite tribes that always kept their tribal identity. We've noticed that all the way through. It's a very mixed, it's a very mixed uh, ethnic picture. And they have probably their dialects, too, as far as that goes. Well, there's an indication of that, too. But here, the Nephites dominated the church and gave it to the whole people. Now, they, when they break off this way, this, this has happened before. You notice in the case of Joseph Smith, for quite, a, for quite a while, all the members of his family were still communicating Christians in various churches. Some were Presbyterians, some favored Methodism, and so forth. But then there came a point of decision when it became very clear that what Joseph Smith had given them was something totally different, and then there was a complete break. Then the persecution began in earnest, you see. But for a long time, the family was distributed among these things, and then it became perfectly clear when they accepted Joseph's mission what was happening. The same thing sort of happened here. It was the Nephites who broke off here. They called themselves Nephites, and uh, the others went there. And they were a very small minority. You get the impression here, because of the three tribes and so forth, the, that it was a ra rather arrogant thing. They call themselves the true believers, and they break off and make the true church. No, it tells us down here in the 40th verse that they were a very tiny minority, actually. The more wicked part of the people were exceedingly more numerous than were the people of God. So they weren't doing, pulling any fancy stuff at all. They were just a small minority. They decided to go on, to keep on by themselves. Uh, this would get them into all the more trouble. And so, we have opposed to the three tribes of Lamanites who broke off from the rest, renounced the whole thing. And from time to time, nations have this happens again in our time. Notice this is another familiar phenomenon uh, sociologically. We have time and time. Well, I talked about uh, Lebanon. Uh, in, you couldn't tell the difference between a, a Maronite Christian uh, and a Jew and, uh, and a Muslim and a Sunnite and a Shiite in, in Beirut at all until all of a sudden they broke up into different factions and started fighting each other. Same thing in Iran today. After World War I, all of a sudden the nations of the Holy Roman Empire emerged as individual nations with individual religions, individual languages, and everything. It always had them, but now they assert themselves and exclude all others. Well, like Serbia, there's a Serbian church with a Serbian cross and a Serbian service and so forth. Quite different from the Roman Catholic Church in Croatia. And then and you had Slovenia and Slovakia and you had Bohemia and uh, you had Bulgaria and Romania. All those, each one had its own language and so forth. It wasn't after, till after World War I that they all broke up and became absolutely separate, independent, proud nations with their own traditions and so forth. So it goes and comes. Then another time they'll be united together. See, the Soviets brought them together again the same. They've tried for the United States of Europe, uh, this, that, and the other. So we break up and we separate. The same sort of thing here. The feeling of union is very strong at some times, during World Wars, for example. And at other times, feeling of sectionalism is very strong. When Texas is an independent republic, in the South they fly the, the Confederate flag and so on. And the same sort of thing happens. Uh, I've been doing laser, and there's uh, uh, Joachim, 
a German professor by the name of Joachim in the 1930s wrote a massive work called The Wandlung der Weltanschauung, how in every society throughout history from the beginning, there have been a century of binding and a century of loosening, a century when things come under strict controls, rules, man, and then a century of liberalizing, of breaking down, and you notice these are the two tendencies that go on, the gay and melancholy flex from time to time. We become more severe, more strict, uh, more uh, militant and so forth. And then another time we become more, religi uh, more liberal, more lax and so forth. He says that's happened, and it usually runs by centuries, you see. The 19th century was the lax one. In the 17th century, the 18th century, well, the 18th century was the, the one of, of, of relaxation, in spite, because it was under people like Joseph II and, and Catherine the Great and Frederick and so forth, that we have these great liberal kingdoms. They, first, you have the enlightened despots, so let people do anything they want. So, 18th century, everything, and then the, the 19th century, everything tightens up with Napoleon and uh, then we get to the 20th century and so forth. But then, anyway, you have these alternate periods of binding and loosening. Which period are we in today? We're in a period of binding right now, aren't we? Uh, we're helpless, we're, uh, we're almost brain dead today. People do not take independent ways that are free in thinking about things like that. We uh, don't think about anything anymore. And this is the, quite, a, quite a contrast to earlier generations of the church when it was all very different when I, in the last century when I was, uh, uh, I am an Edwardian, you know. I was, I was actually Edwardian. I was born during the reign of Edward VII. The, uh, wonderful to be Edwardian. I've given poems about that. But these, uh, so this is what happens, you see. We see this sort of things with, well, the Indian tribes are now trying to assert their individuality and so forth. And just as today, the Soviet satellites are, are asserting theirs. They're breaking loose. They're now, they're, this is what's happening. Well, the same thing happens here. See, we've seen they broke up into tribes before. Now this is happening again. Don't be surprised if it happens at certain intervals because that's the way things go. And we're back to square one now, you see, even as it was in the beginning, just where they were. They taught their children to hate the children of God, even as the Lamanites were taught to hate the children of Nephi. At the beginning, I say, here, here's Ireland, here's the Lebanon, here are the Philippines, here's Cyprus, here's Armenia, here are the Sikhs, here's the Afrikaners, here's the Tabra and so forth, all the, uh, the things that go on. That goes way back, the Azerbaijanians and Armenians today, you know, the Malays, the Sri Lanka and the Chinese. All that throughout the world you're having these, these splits going on today where they're teaching to, to be, their children to be proud of their own culture and to hate the opposition. And you get some terrible things happening there. This utter hatred that you get is so Iran is a classic example with the, with the uh, hostages and so forth. Irrational, wild, extreme. I think the Book of Mormon is exaggerated. As it heats up here, it becomes more and more like our world. You see, a few generations ago, this didn't make much sense, but it certainly does now. So they taught their children, even as it was in the beginning, and we're told it began in the beginning with the children of Adam, the Cainites and the Sethites, the Sethians, those who followed Seth. Cain taught his children to hate them, and this went on ever, ever after. And it is what we do have here, a very religious, cult-centered civilization. And you see what's emerging here, the well-known Mesoamerican pattern of, of religion, of the familiar imagery of the overdone, the great ceremonial centers, and uh, the vast uh, wealth ceremonial and otherwise here we have here. Uh, and they did build up churches and they did do yeah, adorn them with all manner of precious things. And this happened, this the building up churches, building, big, big church building, hundreds, remember, hundreds of these towers and with all their processions and their precious, a great display of precious things. So things are, things are moving in the expected direction here. And uh, the same thing happened on the dormants, you know, in the Counter-Reformation in the, in the 17th century. That produced the Baroque, these extremely, these lavishly overdone, ornate, lavish Baroque style of, of Southern Europe, uh, which was largely victorious. It uh, made such an impression on the people, they got such an appetite for this theatrical, overladen, heavily burdened, gold-plastered Baroque with uh, little putti and uh, plaster figures all over the place. It's, it's quite impressive, but they said, this is what heaven is like. But the same thing happens here, this, uh, this emphasis on endowment as, as a counter-reformation. 
And the next is inevitable. Our good old pals, the Gadiatans, must emerge now. This, this we'll have to expect, won't we, now? The wicked part of the people began to build up the secret oaths and combinations of the Gadiatans. That was irresistible. Again, now we're getting something. This added to verse 41, you see, where they get the forms of the ornamentation, the adornment, the splendor, and so forth. Now we get the, the Aztec aspect of it, the Mongol, the Mahdi, the Dos Volt, the, the fanatical, the savage, bloodthirsty human sacrifice and things like that. They, they follow later. This comes in here now. Uh, yes. and, the, and Christianity and Islam alike, I say, along with the Aztecs and the Mongols, the Mahdi and, and the Crusades and so forth, they were the most cynical, the most greedy, the most cruel, most uh, sadistic when they were most pious. It was a great thing, you see, because only God could authorize the bloody things they were doing, so it was, everything was in the name of God. The name of God is perpetually on their lips. A single syllable in English, all they have to do is use it, and it's just about anything you want to do. God wills it, it's God's idea. Deus Volt, you see the slogan of the Crusades. It is the will of God. Anything we do, like the King of, she uh, the King, of uh, King Solomon, when he heard the Queen of Sheba was approaching him through the desert with her army, uh, her hordes, he, he says to his jinns, "You go, go underground, make a tunnel underground, and you get to her at her camp as soon as you can, and bring her throne back to me." He's going to surprise her with her throne when she comes up. But be sure you do it quick, because we must rob her before she becomes a, a Muslim. It won't be legal to rob her after she's a Muslim. That would be wicked. But as long as she's not a Muslim, we can do anything we want. So go and steal her throne, he says. But, but do it before she becomes a Muslim. That's going to be all right. The story of Solomon. Well, that's the principle of the thing. Um, like, like with us, of course, the Ten Commandments protect only our friends. They apply only to people we like. Uh, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not kill, uh, etc. Thou shalt not steal. Well, you're not going to lie, kill, and steal your friends from your friends, are you? It's only your well, it's all right with your enemies. You get medals for that. The Ten Commandments only apply about 50 percent, you see, just to the people we want to apply them to. There's nothing wrong, of course, with killing and robbing from enemies, destabilizing their economies and things like that. Well, so here we go. Now, vi tibi. What do we have here? The uh, People began to be proud in their hearts because of their exceeding riches and become vain like the Lamanites. <laughs> this vai tibi, I was thinking of something that St. Augustine wrote. Vai tibi flumen moris humani, quis tibi resistet. Oh, way, woe to thee, thou tide of human custom. Who can resist you? When all the people are doing one thing, no one can resist it. Even though the Lord tells the Jews, thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, just because everybody's doing it. That's no excuse. Well, here, this is what happens. It, everybody gets swept along in this evil tide now. Even these good people that were holding out. An amazing picture here. The people who were called people of Nephi, these late righteous people, a 2 a began to be proud in their hearts, and 10 guesses why, of course, because of their exceeding riches. Here we go again. This is where I came in, you might say. Uh, the, uh, oh yes, this is 43. They greatly outnumbered Nephites, began to go along with the others, of course. It was the custom. They were completely surrounded by these people and so forth, so everybody went that way. It was the name of the, if, if riches were the name of the game, they, uh, they could show them a thing or two. And that's true, as you remember, people like the, the, uh, the Quakers and uh, certain abstemious sects, the Dutch reformed and so forth, they quickly got very rich because of their true, their, their thrifty, hard-working, sober habits and so forth. And of course then they became just like anybody else, the riches became something. So, this is the, here it is now, from this time the disciples began to decide. There's the stroke of doom again because of their exceeding riches become vain like unto their brethren the Lamanites, and from this time the disciples began to sell. This is the turning point. Here again we see throughout history the disciples of Jesus remain a distinct, a distinct group, you notice. Uh, the, uh, and uh, the disciples begin to starve. They're, they still have, the, they must be a very small group now, sort of really. Oppressed. Notice in the 44th verse. From this time, the disciples began to, to sorrow. The disciples were, were something special. Again, again, you see. But 
the fatal response to the call of riches that seals the doom of the people. I was going to take time and, uh, and read, but the semester's running short now. I was going to read you something from the Roman satirist, the, great, the only great thing Roman produces, it's marvelous, literature of satire. It describes their civilization right down to the ground. So much like ours, you wouldn't believe it, you see. Marvelous, would you? No, please. Well, I won't have time. Please take time. Not today, no. I'm not, I didn't bring it with me, I'm not going to talk about it. It's very funny, you, you die laughing because you recognize everything there. I mean, it's devastating. There's never such a commentary on wealth as Petronius. He, he just, oh boy, he, he burns your ears, but it all comes home to us, very much so. But this is the one that seals it, you see. And, uh, what do we do in the next? And 300 years passed, the people of Nephi and the Lamanites had become exceedingly wicked, one like unto another. Well, so much for race and everything else, you see. Good people, the good guys and the bad guys. This is not two different kinds of, wit of wickedness, you know. They're all playing the same game. When you talk about power gain, popularity or authority, and the lust of the flesh, as the, the four things that Nephi talks about, they all play that. It's a leveling out process, a one-party system in which everything is approved or covered up. They're all good guys now. And it tells us in the next verse that they are a business civilization based on commerce and finance. The robbers of Gadianton spread all over all the face of the land, and there were none who were righteous, save it were the disciples of Jesus. Then you, there you still have that nucleus there. I'd like to know who they were, you see. And gold and silver did they lay up in store in abundance and did traffic in all manner of traffic. Notice they lay up gold and silver was based on finance and in commerce. Traffic, all manner of traffic, exchange, commerce, business, banking, all the rest of it, which are far more sophisticated in the ancient world than we've been willing to think before. They had, they had everything. They had common stock companies and everything else. We're not sophisticated today. And then in the 48th verse, we see the, well then, the, this was rich spoil also, rich soil for the spread of the Gadianton group. And then again, the 48th verse, the, the, 40, the 48th verse, the, the stroke of doom. It had come time now to hide up the records, get ready to close up shop. It's all over when it reaches this point. Notice how you, the finality of that word. A man beginning, being constrained by the Holy Ghost did hide up the records which were sacred. Even all the sacred records which had been handed down from generation, they're going to close up shop now. We've reached the end of the story. We might as well go home here. Was even until 320th year from the coming of Christ. And he hid them up for the same purpose that they've been hid up since the days of Adam. Enoch tells us that he hid up the books of Adam, Adam, of Adam so they wouldn't be destroyed in the flood. That's, that's the way the Pista Sophia begins with uh, Enoch had, uh, uh, burying the books of Adam. Hiding, he, he hid them up in a solid rock. He, he cemented them in, like, very much like the, uh, the plates that Moroni had. There was a, a, a stony shrine, a, a piece of solid rock with a hollow in it, cut out, squared and so forth, plastered up, put in another rock and cemented it in. That, that would weather the flood. So, well, that's just a story and so forth. But this tradition that the record has been hid to come forth in a later time, but always hid after the last entry had been made. It had to be pretty near the end so that you wouldn't miss any of it. And then it was hidden up, but to come forth at a later time, after the earth had passed through some great trial, some great change, and we know now from this, about the ages of extermination, that these great trials and changes do take place. There have been periods of extermination when whole civilizations have been wiped out. Well, we'll get that when we get to the Jaredites. I thought we'd finish this chapter today, but then the, uh, oh, now, if you have, Tears, prepare to shed them now, because we come to the Book of Mormon now. It starts out with a colophon, which is, tells us that it's an autograph. It was written by his own hand, the colophons, to tell you what the book is about and who wrote it and under what circumstances and so forth. I, Mormon, make a record of the things which I have both seen and heard, eyewitness account, you see, and call it the Book of Mormon. Now, this is after Cumorah. This is after the whole thing is finished. This is the last conclusion that he's in, putting in here, and it's before the other stories. But uh, don't think that this is following in chronological order. It isn't. This is when the whole thing is, order, is over. It is as 
as Tennyson would say, the last echo of a great cry. And uh, I make a record of the things which I have both seen and heard and call it the Book of Mormon. So this is the Book of Mormon proper, just this little book here. But it tells the whole story again. Here we go. Uh, when a man hid up the records, he came to me being about 10 years of age. Now, obviously, Mormon was, in all modesty of course, a phenomenal person. He was chosen to lead the armies at 16. There have been generals that young before. And uh, he was uh, recognized as a person of amazing gifts and talents. And uh, he's the one man about whom the whole thing centers here. He supports the people, then he withdraws himself, and he can't. It breaks his heart. He has to go back to them again and so forth. He's perhaps the, the most outsized figure of the Book of Mormon. There are some gigantic, gigantic figures in the Book of Mormon, like the brother of Jared and Nephi and so forth. But Mormon is, is the most tragic figure, and he, he is the most epic figure, actually, even more than the brother of Jared. But he came to me when he was 10 years old, and he says, I see me, you're a pretty smart brat. And uh, he says, uh, you know, you're a sober child and quick to observe. You know what's going on. So I have advice for 15 years from now. See, the, he knows the time is about 15 years. It's about 15 years from now. When you're 24, uh, you go to the land with the hills which shall be called Shim. Incidentally, notice, it's an interesting thing here. The Lord does not have, hold any special brief for stupid people. Uh, we should not cultivate that in, in the religious department or anywhere else. And uh, the hill Shim is very interesting. Uh, where's Malahuzis? What's the Arabic word for Shim? If you look it up in the dictionary, it means north, north country. Shim is north in any Semitic language. Of course, you get Shimal from that, the same sort of thing, left hand. But when you're facing east, it's Shimal, it's the left. But Shim it means north. And sure enough, we learn a little later on that when they go further north, they get to the hill Shim. So here's another one of those things where the Book of Mormon just casually tosses off, just a, just a bit of evidence, uh, no extra charge, you see. But people don't notice these things. Therefore, go to the hill Shim, and there I have deposited unto the Lord all the sacred engravings concerning his people. He knew the Mormon, the movement would be northward. See, it wouldn't be safe for them to remain south. And they go, start into this long, tragic retreat here. And then, Mormon here, and he says, take the plates, and the remainder shall, you shall leave in the place where they are. Just take the plates of Nephi. Those are the ones we have. Grave on the plates, when will the others be found? Where's the hill Shim, you see? And all the things you have observed concerning this people. So you add to them, bring them up to date as of 15 years from now, he says. Now, I'm Mormon, being a descendant of Nephi, there is another interesting comment on races. And we think the Nephites were the descendants of Nephi. Well, then what's he boasting about, being a descendant of Nephi, then? It's a rare thing by now. Pure blood of Nephi is going to be hard to find around here. And as plainly, all, all the people were not. Nephites were not descendants of Nephi, as we see in the eighth verse here. He says they, got, they called them, remember, the Nephites and Jacobites and Josephites and the Zoramites. This war was between the Nephites and the Lamanites, and they called them that. They're all divided this way into parties. So here we go. He, uh, he was 11 years old, and he was taken by his father to the land southward to Zarahemla, the big city, the big capital. And boy, was he impressed as a little kid, he says. The land was covered with buildings. Never saw anything like that. As it were, the, the people were, as it were, numerous as the sands of the sea. Now, this is important for the Book of Mormon. You say, we call, we talk about, uh, well, if there had been such vast, vast numbers and so forth. We'll see what vast, vast numbers are. When they, when they gather all their forces for a big war down here, how many do they have in the army? 30,000. That's just one division. In our army, 27,000, they make a division, you see. One division with its supplies and everything, one division. And he calls that as numerous as the sands of the sea. Well, 11-year-old, he's impressed as far as that goes. You'd be impressed with these things. So we have to be very careful and <laughs> not be simplistic when we read the Book of Mormon. But it says people, <laughs> this kid, when he tells us that people, were, if Zarahemla were as numerous as the sands of the sea, how many hundred trillion people are there? <laughs> Doesn't mean that at all, does it? It's a metaphor here, as it were, the sands of the sea. And there began to be a war between the Lamanites and the Nephites. Well, he happened to be there, happy event. It's like a visit to, to Beirut, isn't it? And this war was between the Nephites and the Lamanites, and the Lemuelites and the Ishmaelites are operating on a tribal basis now. Lamanites and the Lemuelites and the Ishmaelites are called Lamanites. It was just a political title, is all. They were called Lamanites. 
The two parties were called parties. They were parties. They were not nations. They were not families. They were parties. Were called Nephites and Lamanites. The war was mingled on the borders of the Zarahemla, as it usually was on the waters of Sidon. That was the classic battleground. The Nephites gathered together a great number of men, even to exceed the number of 30,000. Wow! <laughs> Almost a division, you <laughs> see, an army division. Well, when you, have, when you consider the Russians had 150 divisions on the line at one time, uh, that's an army that is an army, you see. And do you know that during World War II, uh, the British never committed more than three divisions at a time. Three divisions were as many as they ever had. In you got from the B BBC and so forth that they were, they were fighting the whole war, but they never committed more than three divisions. They couldn't afford to. They'd lost too many. Well, anyway, and the Nephites beat the Lamanites, three cheers, and the Lamanites withdrew, and there was peace for four years. But wickedness did prevail. It didn't do them any good here. Let me see if we had anything very wise to say here. Um, well, there's four years of peace. They brought no improvement. The Lamanites were still the bad guys, but that's not the problem, you notice here. The uh, Lamanites were through and there was peace, but wickedness did prevail upon the face of the land. Well, you say, well, they'd beaten the Lamanites. The Lamanites were settled, four years of peace and so forth. Say the Lamanites were the bad guys, that's true, but that wasn't the problem. As Shevardnadsky and others say, we hear, we hear quite often the saying, America must have an enemy. The enemy right now we're picking in desperation is poor old Castro. Uh, because the enemy must be the embodiment of evil. He can't just be an enemy, politically or so forth. But, uh, uh, and so he's now being compared to Cesescu. Je uh, Cesescu. <laughs> Though he's a good friend of Mandela and Gorbachev and people like that. Uh, this is so we can go on. We have to have this evil enemy so we can go on uh, being the good guys without having to repent. This is a great convenience. The well, anyway, removing the danger left the Nephites free to, uh, to do their thing, and they just got worse, the Lamanites and so forth. The brotherhood departs here, the brethren departed here, and this verse, things get very bad. There are no gifts from the Lord anymore. The Holy Ghost doesn't come upon any more because of their wickedness. They've gone all the way, and yet they don't worry. They're not going to think about repent because they know who the wicked people are. They're the Lamanites, of course. I, being 15 years old, and he's still sober, well, after what he's seen, I think he would be, Therefore, he's the one who says, I've seen nothing, nothing pleasant in all since the days of my birth. What a time to live, see? Uh, and so, th this happened. There were no gifts. They cut the wires and then complained that there's no revelation, no messages. Uh, they cut themselves off, and God cuts himself off. Everything can cut shut down. There is a horror plot here. When God... Re removes the spirit entirely, when there's nothing left but evil. There are such pictures, and we have them. Read the writings of Lucan or of Salvia, or the Lamentation literature, which is very great, both the Babylonian and Egypt and so forth, or the Lebensmead. Read the Border Balance from Scotland. Talk about bleak and horrible situations. And, uh, or if you want a document of absolute personal despair, read Scott's journal in, when he went to South Pole, in memory. None of them survived. The journal that comes to us came from the tent where they were all found dead. And so there are times when the Lord turns off the power completely, and this is very dangerous. And if we go on thinking we don't have to repent because other people are wicked, that's what we got the Book of Mormon for. That's, we're going to see a lot of that. We're just beginning to warm up here. Uh, and in the 15th and 17th verse, notice the boy Mormon is, is in the position of Abraham. Remember when he was young, he said he tried to, per, uh, to persuade his family, but they did utterly refuse to listen to my voice. In fact, his father even volunteered him for sacrifice. Uh, it got that bad. I did endeavor to preach to them, but it's not going to do any good, so he shuts him right off. I was forbidden that I should preach. They had willfully rebelled against their God. <laughs> Therefore, the beloved disciples were taken away. You can read in the Jaredite case, the prophets mourned and withdrew. There's nothing else you can do. God forbids him to preach. Uh, it would be, more preaching would be damnation. So who takes over? Well, naturally, the Gadianton element, about as low as you can get. These Gadianton robbers were among the Lamanites who did infest the land in so much notice. They're among the Lamanites. They mingle with Lamanites here, and they, they add their forces to them. 
and they infest the land. The inhabitants began to hide their treasures up in the earth. They became slippery because the Lord had cursed the land. They could not hold them. Remember, that's exactly what Samuel the Lamanite had said. When he said, uh, you place your, you place your, all your love and your riches, behold, your riches will become slippery that you cannot hold them. Of course they do. I mean, the, the stock market can be wiped out in an hour as far as that goes. That did happen. I'm just not talking about the October 19th of, was it November of 87, but I'm talking about the October 29, which I remember very well, when everybody got wiped out. I mean, completely wiped out. So these things can happen. And they became slippery because that they could not hold them. Uh, and the very same thing happened at the end. I mentioned Salvin. He describes what happened in the fourth century. The Roman Empire collapsed suddenly, as you know, and everything became slippery. And that's why you find such interesting treasures all over Europe, uh, because they were hidden on that occasion. Everybody hid up their treasures, the only chance. They might come back and get them. Very tragic cases. Hundreds of these treasures are found. The most tragic, I suppose, is in the Cave of Letters when the Romans occupied Palestine, the Jews. Not at Masada, we find some of them there, but in the Cave of Letters, which is nearby, you find where the people hid out for the last time, and there they all died because they couldn't escape. And they, they were in these huge caves there in the uh, Wadi Aver. And they give us their letters and their parting words and so forth. But in Europe at this time, at the end of the Roman Empire, the Bagaudi took over. They were just wandering bands that get together and go over and starting looting and raiding, and they became uh, the terror of the whole country. They continued. You, you get your own, you get your free companies. Way down in the, in the 14th century, you get the free companies, just bands that go everywhere. And you get the robber barons that set up their own castles on the, on the passes and, and uh, tax everybody, any merchant who goes through. Uh, for that, or they won't let them go through and so forth. Everybody's fighting everybody else. Well, these hills have been achieved. In fact, for large, long periods of time, they have been the normal condition. Life on earth has been utterly insecure. How can we be completely insecure? Well, hang around. You'll see how it can be completely insecure. And so we get, I say, the Begaudi, the Cave of Letters, the, uh, the Masada, and so forth. And, uh, well, that's uh, the, the time of the Crusades. Remember how they broke up. And... and 1348, <coughs> the Dance of Carver and all the things, they, the play, these things. Well, it's the end of the ancient world here now. No, it came to pass. This is what happened at the end of the ancient world. What did they do? They went to sources. Everybody took to magic at that time. Everybody that was haunted, they felt, remember? Uh, another expression from the Book of Mormon, we were surrounded by demons, they say. Because how do we account for it? It reaches the point of sheer desperation. There were sorceries, rich crafts. You put your only trust in these sort of things. In, in astrology and chance and luck in the market and so forth. Sorceries, witchcraft, magic, power of the evil one was wrought upon the face of the land. A spiritual vacuum, you see, even as the words are fulfilling. I w saw the pocket contents of hundreds of, of German soldiers during the war. And, uh, well, thousands, as a matter of fact, I had to go through them. And uh, it's different from World War I. They said just about every soldier was carrying a Bible. You didn't find any Bibles, but you found rabbit's foot, you found charms, you found lucky charms, you found uh, crooks and sata, you find all sorts of superstition. There were superstitions, get out, but they had no faith. It's, it was a very sad thing. Then everybody feels helpless, everybody feels haunted. Magic takes over, witchcraft, because what else can you do? So charms and talismans abound here at this time. And then, lucky, lucky, lucky. Mormon. He, he launches his career. They choose him at this time. They choose him to command the army. And he's uh, 15 or 16 years old, isn't he? But uh, again, between the Lamanites and the Nephites, notwithstanding I being young, large in stature, therefore the people of Nephi appointed me that I should be their leader at 16. Well, Prince Eugene, that age, <laughs> Napoleon wasn't much older when he won the Battle of Marengo. He would have been chosen the same way. Palnatoki, the terror of the north, who ruled from Jomsburg at the mouth of the Vistula, he was the great commander of the pirates of the north. He was 12 years old. Everybody feared him. So, so there, are, there are prodigies in the military business. I think I like, I like Prince Eugene, extremely young and so forth. Uh, and Alexander, you know, was exact, wasn't exactly aged. Remember, he was 32 when he died, but when he, his conquest against Alexander, so we're all made in his 20s. Well, Anyway, uh, he must have impressed people because, remember, he impressed uh, Amaran as being phenomenally smart. Uh, 
sober, observant. He'd, he'd given that impression all along, so the people knew that they had there's someone, a person of real stature here, and also large physically in stature. He was, I say he was a heroic figure, this, this Mormon is. And now the great retreat begins. 55 years of falling back now. Very, very sad here, and this happens again. See, it came to pass in my 16th year, I did go forth at the head of an army of the Nephites. 365 years, and the Lamanites did frighten my armies. They would not fight. They began to retreat toward the north countries. Not a fight. It doesn't become a rout yet, but the big retreat now begins. They're not going to do it, the great retreat. It's a rear guard action. Remember Chief Joseph, who retreated for three years with the U.S. Army after him to get over the border out of Montana and so forth? And, and Darius, his long retreat from, uh, well, we think of all sorts of retreats, from Alexander, and the retreat from Moscow. Well, that's 3,000 miles. That's over 2,000 miles, that's a, some retreat, you know, falling back all the time. It wasn't necessarily a rear guard action because they weren't being hotly pursued. <laughs> but there are other retreats uh, where this, well, Zukov and Suvorov, when, uh, when von Pauli it was in, in Stalingrad, you see. Uh, Suvorov built up, not Suvorov, he's, he's cast in a great general. Uh, Zukov built up this enormous reserve of 100, almost 150 divisions waiting for him. <laughs> And from then on, it was just one long retreat for the Natchez, all the way from Stalingrad right back to Berlin. A tremendously long retreat. And uh, this is the sort of thing that's going to happen here. As a matter of fact, it's not as long as some of those retreats. Well, Xenophon, the March of the 10,000, you might say they'd lost their shirt and were trying to get home. Um, but Xenophon's classic work on the March of the 10,000, trying to get home. But anyway, they fall back on a place called Angola. Things move fast here. Take possession of it, make preparations to defend themselves. They dig in there, they're going to hold out there. They fortify the city. This is the system they're going to use. They fall back on strong points and, and fortify them and try to hold them. Uh, but there is a... Com and they drove them out. They drove them out of the land of David, and they came to the land of Joshua, which is on the shores west by the seashore. Uh, these land, Joshua, why would they have biblical... These names of biblical lands here, well, that's what we do all the time. Of course, we name our own lands. When, the, uh, when we move, all the names we give to our lands and cities are those we have from the Old Country. And as far as naming them after, after heroes of the Old Testament, this is exactly what people would do when you go in, when you go into the classes that went into Rome, to upstate New York, Joseph Smith's country, you, you have Rome and you have Athens and you have Syracuse, you have all the old classical names of towns up there, things like that. We carry our our old names over, and we keep our tradition. They don't invent names cold unless they describe either the founder of the city or some peculiar area about this, Battle Mountain or something like that. But uh, land of the border of Joshua, west by the seashore. We could follow these on the map, but um, sad story. There they gathered again together in one body. That's a bad sign when you gather together in one body. You should keep two bodies so it can counterattack and all sorts of things. But that, as Clausewitz says, uh, beaten armies, of course, tend to bunch together for security, a feeling of, of security in each other's presence and feeling that, that in mass and in number of their strength it's, it's a dangerous thing when this happens, and it happens here to one body. The land was, what a picture, what a marvelous eighth verse this is, describing the complete breakdown of government. This is exactly as things were in 1918, 17 and 18 in Russia and in eastern Germany, the same way in Berlin, actually. I've heard people describe who went through it. And uh, the land was filled with robbers and Lamanites. Notwithstanding the great destruction which hung over my people, they did not repent of their evil doings. Therefore there was blood and carnage spread throughout all the face of the land, both on the north part of the Nephites and also on the part of the Lamanites. And it was one complete revolution throughout all the face of the land. Uh, let's hope we never live to see that. Some people, you know, there have been science fiction, Ray Bradbury has written a story inspired by this verse, uh, and uh, which is... It's possible, you see. And, uh, and we have now the Lamanites and the king. They had a name, his name was Aaron. And here we have a super army, 44,000. Now we're getting big armies, almost two divisions. You see. And it came to pass that I beat him and he fled. Aha, now, this is a very nice thing happening here. Uh, Mormon finally checks their advance. Uh, there's a complete breakdown of public order. Uh, such as you find. You know, in the, if you wanted to have real fun and were very rich, the thing you used to do in the 50s and early 60s was fly down to Rio 
in the 40s. That was the place to go. Don't go to Rio today. If you're found in the inner city of Rio, you're as good as dead today. See, you don't go anymore. Things, or some countries like the Sierra Leone, we have an ambassador, a, a, a Persian girl, a marvelous girl who joined the church, married the daughter of a, and married the ambassador to Sierra Leone, who, who was a black man, a very fine man. And they lived as, uh, they lived there. She had a great influence in Sierra Leone, but it was a, it was a country in which, at the time there, there was no law or order at all. It was, nothing was safe, and nobody was safe. So we have these conditions in the world today, and you're lucky if you, uh, you better stay in your hotel and keep your blinds down and things like this. These are the instructions they give you wherever you go today. You see. And go to the American ambas embassy, they'll tell you, sorry, we can't protect you. You just have to do the best you can and so forth. And get out the country if you can, maybe we can get you out. This is the way they talk everywhere now. What a world we live in, saved by the bell. It could get worse and worse, you see. <laughs> so, but now look, when you get some, tw he was 23 years old, this, this kid from the farm that wrote all this stuff. And uh, don't try to tell me <laughs> he made it up. <laughs> <laughs>